Okay, thanks again. So my name is Amr Zaidan, and as you just heard, I'm um, and basically a clinical investigator at Yale University where I focus on myeloid malignancies. Um, my main areas of interest are really in early phase clinical trials and outcomes and effectiveness research in, in this area. And today I'm going to be talking to you about iron chelation therapy in MDS, which I think is, um, as you just heard from David, is one of the most challenging uh, subjects in MDS because of the lack of uh, high quality evidence compared to other areas. Uh, you know, yesterday you were hearing about all these phase three trials in MPN, and there are a bunch of phase three trials and phase, randomized phase two trials in MDS in covering this, different aspects of the disease. But in iron chelation, really, we have very limited evidence, which I'm going to try to summarize today for you and uh, to try to answer this question that we always think about is whether we should chelate or uh, not chelate uh, patients with uh, MDS. So as you know, MDS, basically the most common feature of MDS really uh, in terms of presentation is having anemia, where more than 90% of patients have anemia. And many of these, almost half of them, become transfusion uh, dependent. And since each unit of blood that's transfused to these patients have 200 to 250 milligrams of elemental iron, this tends to accumulate in the patients, largely because the human body does not have a natural way of getting rid of iron. So all the iron that goes in, there is no way to get, get it out, basically. Um, and as a result of ongoing and chronic transfusions, many of these patients develop trans, uh, transfusional iron overload, um, which is common in MDS. So in addition to the chronic transfusion uh, that leads to iron overload in MDS, there are a number of other mechanisms that contribute to this. One of them is having um, ineffective erythropoiesis, which lead to an appropriate suppression of the hepcidin level. As many of you know, hepcidin is the dam that prevents excessive iron accumulation in, in the human body. In cases of MDS, there's an, an appropriately low level of hepcidin, and that leads to an increase in the ferroportin, which is a transmembrane export protein, which leads to increased duodenal absorption from the gut of iron, as well as export of iron from its stores to the plasma. And the common pathway of all these mechanisms in increase in the iron uh, that is bound to transferrin, and eventually the non-transferrin-bound iron, or NTPI, and the lipyl plasma iron, both of them increase. And those are the two most toxic forms of iron, and their accumulation leads to a number of uh, end organ damage and worsening of survival in patients with MDS. So this is another figure summarizing the same concept, but I think um, the reason why I wanted to show it is to emphasize the role of the hepcidin as, a, as possibly a potential target in the future for iron overload in patients with MDS. So as you can see in this figure here, uh, basically as the transferrin saturation increase as a result of the increased amount of iron in the body, the non-transferrin bound iron increases and there's a higher incidence of cardiac complication in those patients. Um, so it's around 65% is 65% to 70% of transfer, transferrin saturation are when these complications start to occur. And a result of accumulation of iron, uh, multiple changes occur. So one of them is the generation of uh, reactive oxygen species, and these can damage the membranes, the proteins, and the DNA. And uh, they can precipitate basically uh, chronic instability, which over time can cause mutagenesis and increase the rate of progression to AML. And preclinical data actually have shown that chelation can induce differentiation and apoptosis, apoptosis in, in cell lines with the, uh, from patients with AML and MDS. So what's the controversy in terms of iron chelation use in patients with MDS? Um, I think the most important thing is that we know that, trans, uh, that iron accumulation in the body is associated with worse outcome, with worse survival, and uh, uh, basically uh, risk of progression to AML. Um, while there's a higher level of uh, um, high level evidence in patients with chronic thalassemia and sickle cell disease, basically chronic anemias that require transfusion, such evidence does not exist in MDS. And a lot of the use in uh, MDS has been extrapolation of these trials. So um, this for a long time with the availability only of an infusional form of iron chelation uh, led to a low use of iron chelation in general in MDS. But since 2000 when deferacerox was 
approved uh, uh, basically for use in uh, uh, cases of chronic transfusional iron overload, this debate has become reignited because of uh, potential for improvement of our patient outcomes using iron chelation therapy. So I'm going to review some of the literature looking at the outcomes with um, basically iron overload and how does that affect the survival of MDS patients. Here this is a large Italian uh, basically data set that shows accumulation of uh, or transfusion dependency in patients with MDS is associated with a significant worsening in survival. As you can see, the red curves are the patients who are transfusion independent and the blue are the transfusion dependent. And also in terms of leukemia-free survival. So those patients are dying sooner and have a higher risk of progression to leukemia when you are uh, requiring frequent transfusions. And when we look at the level of transfusion need as well, the higher the number of units that are being transfused each month, the worse the outcomes and the higher the risk of progression to AML. Now, you know, the ongoing discussion in MDS all the time is, does that reflect that transfusion by itself is bad, or is it a reflection of the underlying biology of the MDS? And this is a question that um, tends to always shadow the discussion of chelation in those patients. Serum ferritin is a very um, commonly used by a marker for iron accumulation in patients with chronic anemia and MDS, and high level of ferritin also have been associated with worse outcomes in patients with MDS, as well as progression to AML, similar to the transfusion frequency, and also the level of the ferritin, not only the high versus low, uh, the higher levels of ferritin in the serum have been also associated with worse outcome. So I think there's a very clear um, consistency of this data showing that higher transfusion needs and higher level of iron in the body as reflected by the ferritin are associated with worse survival and risk of progression to AML. And not only that, but when we look basically, and this is the same Italian series I mentioned at the beginning, non-leukemic deaths, and as many of you know, most of MDS patients don't actually die from progression to ML. It's only one-third of patients that progress to ML. Most of them die from uh, complications related to the cytopenias. Um, so the most common causes of non-leukemic death in patients who are transfusion dependent basically include cardiac conditions, infections, and bleeding. And those basically um, have been shown to be at a higher uh, prevalence in patients who are transfusion dependent. If you can, this is a large SEER claims based study that showed that patients who have um, transfusion dependency have worse, uh, higher incidence of cardiac events, higher incidence of infections, and including fungal infections, as well as marginally increased incidence of diabetes. So again, not only survival, but uh, end organ damage is significantly higher in patients who have uh, transfusion dependency and higher oxygen, uh, sorry, and uh, higher um, iron levels. So there are three drugs that are used in the U.S. basically for iron chelation. Um, the defaroxamine is a drug that uh, has been around for 1968. It has been used for a very long time. The problem with it is it's infusional. It's given usually overnight. It's uh, needed 8 to 12 hours, and it's uh, basically five days or five nights a week, so it's difficult for the patient to comply with. There are two oral versions, uh, Deferacerox and uh, Deferiprone, and I know that we generally try to avoid um, trade names in these talks, but Deferacerox actually have two versions of it, and from the same drug, so I have to go with the, <laughs> with the trade name. So basically, XJ is the, uh, is the older version that has been available since 2005, um, which is a dissolving tablet. Basically, you have to put it in, nick, in orange juice or water or something, basically, to drink it, while the new phone, the Jadino, uh, which is a film-coated tablet that has come become more recently and supposedly has lower risk of um, gastrointestinal side effects. Um, and again, because of the availability of these oral agents, as well as the deferibrone, which is another oral um, agent, those have increased the discussion about whether these drugs should be used in our MDS patients. And all of these drugs basically have the potential of some side effects in terms of uh, cytopenias. Um, thrombocytopenia is a 
black box boring basically with uh, deferocerox uh, as well as risk of GI bleed and renal damage. So we usually we are careful when we use it in patients who have increased um, uh, abnormal creatinine level. The ferriprone also has a black box warning regarding granulocytosis. So I wanted to give this overview of the available drugs before I go into the literature that supports their use in MDS patients because, again, the literature is not that extensive, um, and uh, I'm going to show you some of these studies. So there are not really any published randomized phase two or three studies in, in iron chelation in MDS. So I'm going to show you a number of the retrospective studies. So this study from Canada from Dr. Heather Leitch showed that the overall survival in MDS patients basically, again, and most of these studies have been done in patients with lower risk MDS, intermediate, either low or intermediate one, and many of them were single center, many of them were small number of patients. But as you can see in this study, a huge survival difference between patients who were chelated versus patients who were not chelated. And these studies always invite the question of are these patients being selected by their physicians to receive iron chelation therapy? Because our common belief is that iron chelation usually helps in the long run. So we are choosing, generally, we are choosing the patients that we believe are going to live the longest over the patients who don't think are going to long enough to see the benefit of the drug. So this is a common criticism that many of these papers receive. In this paper, they tried to do a multivariate adjustment for the IPSS, but again, most of the patients were already intermediate one and low, and they found that the use of iron chelation continued to be significant. This study from Germany uh, tried to do a more sophisticated adjustment for the baseline variables using what we call a match pair analysis. So they tried to match the patients based on their IPSS score between those who were chelated and those who were not chelated. And um, what they found, again, there was a survival advantage with the use of chelation, but there was no difference in the rate of progression to AML. Um, I think a very interesting aspect of iron chelation, which I sometimes actually use for some of my patients, is aside from the survival advantage that has been shown in many of these retrospective analyses, but some patients do achieve hematologic responses, and meaning that some patients can have improvement in their blood counts, they can become transfusion independent. And this number is somewhere between 10 to 15 percent is what has been quoted in some of the largest series that have been published around this. So in some patients, and you just heard from Rami talking about the options of patients who have especially lower risk MDS, and unfortunately many of these patients go through different all the therapies basically between ESAs or lenalidomide and HMAs, and they still are transfusion dependent. I have used iron chelation therapy in some of these patients with the main goal of trying to induce um, uh, some improvement in their transfusion needs because this can happen in around 10 percent of, of patients, and it can last, as you can see in the right hand of the slide, it can last for somewhere between four to six months. So how does that happen? We don't really understand fully the mechanism of the, how this actually occurs. But there are different uh, proposed mechanisms, basically. Uh, some of them are in relation to improvement in the uh, reduction in the iron, uh, reduction in the reactive oxygen species, and uh, improvement in the nuclear factor uh, cap uh, pathway. Um, but this is something that's definitely being studied to better understand how these drugs help. So not only whether the patients are being chelated or not is important, but the intensity of the chelation. As you know, these are oral drugs. They have to be given on ongoing basis, and compliance and taking them is important. And there have been several trials looking at the intensity of chelation in relation to survival. And this is one of the French studies that was a prospective, uh, uh, basically non-interventional study. Again, the, basically the oncologist chose to uh, give chelation based on their own consideration of the different risk factors. But as you can see on the um, multivariate adjustment, uh, adjustment that uh, on the right hand of the slide, that basically adequate chelation, which has been defined as more than three days a week of oral DFX uh, or deferoxamine, is associated with a significantly improved risk of, uh, or reduced risk of death, basically. This is a study from the U.S. This is one of the largest um, uh, non-interventional registries published by Lyons et al. looking at uh, the use of uh, DFX in patients with lower risk uh, MDS. And again, as you can see here, that patients who were chelated had significantly higher survival than patients who uh, 
were not chelated. And when the authors looked at the cause of death among these patients, um, as you can see in these figures, that patients who are chelated further, further compared to those who are not chelated have a higher um, or have a lower chance of development of mds -AML, have a lower risk of cardiac disease, and have a lower risk of infection. So it does seem that these studies are going in the direction of better survival and lower uh, complication risk among patients who are chelated versus those who are not chelated. Um, in, in, uh, given that these retrospective studies um, have different criteria for inclusion and different uh, uh, basically populations and uh, different adjustments, we decided to conduct a systematic review and meta-analysis. This is an overview of uh, an abstract that was just submitted three days ago actually to ASH, looking at a combination of these uh, different uh, studies. And from all the literature, we found around actually only nine studies that looked at this question. Five of them were uh, retrospective, four of them were prospective. There were no randomized studies, so we could not include any basically interventional study. And as you can see here, um, systematic reviews generally are done for two purposes. One of them is when you have conflicting results, the adjusted um, overall effect can give you an idea about what's the right way. But as you can see here in the systematic or in this meta-analysis, all of them were to the left of the null, indicating that there is a survival advantage, which was an adjusted one. This is so an adjusted survival advantage. But what struck me in this, um, in this analysis is that the, uh, hazard, the adjusted hazard ratio was quite low, 0.42, which is around 58% reduction in the risk of death, which probably is you know, um, significant when you compare it to many of the drugs that we commonly use. As a comparison, azacitidine in high risk MDS has a hazard ratio of 0.58. Again, for me, I think that definitely reflects that there's some degree of unobservable variables that were not accounted for. Uh, but how much of that is, uh, is, the, is the collation versus how much of it is the selection of the patient is something that remains to be seen. We saw the same effect in terms of uh, reduction the risk of progression to AML. Uh, this was the only study that I could find in patients with high-risk MDS. Most of the collation literature is about lower-risk MDS because in high-risk MDS, patients tend generally to die sooner, and most of us... Uh, often don't use the drugs and they are not really recommended in the guidelines because many of these patients don't long, live long enough to see the benefit of the drug. But this was a recent report from Europe, from all over Europe, basically looking at 51 patients who, again, had a significantly good survival but of 37 months, which is very impressive in patients with high-risk MDS, again, telling you that this is probably a selected population, but there was no control group. So, again, it's, it's difficult to basically make a lot of conclusion out of that. And the last setting in which chelation is generally considered in MDS is in the pre-transplant setting. This is a study that showed that patients who go with iron chelation before transplant and have significant reduction in their ferritin have better outcomes. But again, this is retrospective analysis of, um, you know, involving multiple selection variables. Uh, so we don't have any prospective evaluation in the setting of transplant showing the same effect so far. I'm going to show you a study we've done a few years ago that looked at the effect of DFX among uh, patients in uh, CR Medicare. And the reason why we use Medicare claims is because it's the largest data set that has a large number of MDS patients because most MDS patients are more than 65 years and old, so they are captured by these data sets very well. And um, we use this sophisticated um, adjustment model basically called marginal structural modeling which is effectively, if you are familiar with propensity score matching, uh, which adjusts for observable variables at the baseline, this model adjusts for this in a dynamic way. So every week you, have, you are adjusting for the different uh, variables that affect the chance of choosing uh, one form of either chelation or no chelation to try to correct for, for those confounders. And this is the design of that study. So patients were followed basically from 2005. We had a 12 month look back period to make sure to look for comorbidities and other covariates. We followed the patients basically from the point in which they became transfusion eligible, meaning that they have received more than 10 weeks of worth of transfusions or more than 20 units. And we followed them basically until the end of the study, which was in 2008 or until they uh, basically uh, died. 
And we found that out of 4,000 patients who were, who were chelation eligible by these criteria, only 15% of patients received iron chelation in the U.S. Um, and the prediction or the reasons that, or sorry, the variables that predicted use of chelation were uh, uh, basically African-American race and being from the South and patients who were receiving other therapies while being older being female, having uh, comorbidities, and having a worse performance status, all of them predicted against use of chelation, which is something I guess that fits our um, common sense in terms of how we prescribe these drugs in the, in the clinic. And as you can see in this figure, basically, this is an adjusted hazard ratio uh, using the model that not only the chelation uh, patients who are chelated have a much better survival than who, those who are not chelated, but the cumulative chelation how much the chelation occurred and the duration were associated also with the lower hazard ratio of death. So the entry of uh, oral chelation agents have not only um, basically increased the chance of iron chelation being used in MDS patients, but also it increased the duration. In this curve, you can see the duration after the entry of the ferrocerox in the market. So you can see the median duration is 47 weeks compared to 17 weeks and the chance of having adequate chelation also significantly improved. So a couple of prospective trials have been really published, but they were all single arm. One of them was from the US, one from Europe. This is a European one that showed that chelation basically reduces serum ferritin, and that reduction in serum ferritin correlates with improvement in ALT. Again, no, no clinical heart endpoints were reported in this trial, probably because of the short follow-up. This is a study from uh, the U.S., the U.S. 03, led by Dr. List, basically showing that the use of deferrosterox quickly reduces the lapile plasma iron, and uh, that also was correlated with the reduction in, in uh, liver function enzymes if they were elevated. And the mechanisms by which DF, uh, DFX helps is basically related to reduction in uh, uh, reactive oxygen species, and reduction in iron damage, and uh, sorry, in DNA damage in patients who were previously transfusion dependent. But there are also effects that might not be related to the effect of the effects on iron. So there might be some pleiotropic effects, like what we talk about statins being not only in terms of cholesterol changes. There is some effect on the nuclear uh, factor cap pathway that also might account for some of the advantages we see with iron chelation. This table might not project very well, but it shows you that there is a lot of variability regarding the recommendation of iron chelation between the different guidelines. For example, the NCCN guidelines recommend considering of chelation among patients who receive more than 20 units uh, of blood and who require more than, or who have a ferritin of more than 2,500 if they are lower risk MDS. But the guidelines differ, and there's a lot of patient uh, provider discussion that should happen about the risks and the benefit of the treatment. And the monitoring usually is done using ferritin levels and the amount of transfusions. Sometimes liver biopsies, we generally don't do them because many of these patients are thrombocytopenic, but sometimes we obtain an MRI of the liver or the heart to assess for the degree of the damage. And finally, I'll finish with this slide showing the Telesto study, which each time I talk about chelation, we talk about how this study is gonna solve this uh, <laughs> problem, but it has been actually going forever because I think many, many, um, uh, many hematologists have strong feelings about whether to chelate or not, so this is affecting the enrollment, and they actually ended up needing to significantly cut the number of patients going in the study, and I'm not sure it's gonna answer the question at the end, after it's completed, but I do think we do need such studies because uh, we will never be able to solve this question for sure without having high-level evidence. Thank you so much.